I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss one issue related to um, doing statistical analyses on time frequency data, uh, or I guess analyses more generally, um, in particular with regards to the group level analysis strategy 2, 2A and 2B that I discussed in the previous lecture. So um, how big to make this window? This is one question uh, that, uh, that comes up, and so I want to discuss it a little bit more, in particular in context of what's called circular um, analyses or double dipping. So I said, you know, average across all the data and all the conditions and all the subjects, and then choose a time frequency window, so this one, and you imagine that you are a critical reviewer and see if you would agree that this is a, a reasonable or appropriate uh, window that that's not doesn't seem like it's carelessly done. It doesn't seem like it's done in a way that can bias the results. <clears throat> So here's just um, some examples. So we can say, you know, how about this time frequency window? I would say this looks uh, pretty reasonable. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it could be a bit smaller. But on the other hand, if this window at the group analysis level is too small, then it's going to be, um, it's probably not going to be optimal for individual subjects who might have their peak um, theta response, you know, maybe um, slightly further away. So I would say this is a pretty reasonable thing. How about this? Um, I think, yeah, we can agree that this is uh, not really an appropriate um, window. It seems like it's it's not sort of around, it's not really capturing this theta um, f um, feature of the data. So how about this thing? Yeah, this seems okay. <laughs> it's getting around this uh, beta band uh, late uh, whatever it is feature of the data, so that seems fine. Maybe it could stretch a little bit earlier, I guess, but I, I think that's okay. And then something like this, I think, yeah, this is, when you look at this, you see that it's wrong. First of all, it spans multiple classical frequency bands, so it goes from theta and alpha up to beta. Um, but I think more importantly, it spans a red region and a blue region, so when you average these together, you're going to be, yeah, kind of pushing the results towards zero. So I, I don't understand why anyone would choose a window like this. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So that would be, uh, I would say, that's probably not the best choice of window. It's very important to avoid something called circular inference, which is also called biased statistical selection, and it's colloquially called double dipping. Um, Double dipping or circular inference means that you are selecting uh, windows or you're selecting data to analyze in a way that biases the statistical analyses towards getting some particular result. So let me um, explain what this is a bit. So if you select this window based on a condition average, let's say we have conditions A and conditions B, and here we average conditions A and B together, by averaging the conditions together and then selecting this window, we are not, and then the, the test that we are interested in would be the difference between A and B. You can see that we are not biased to obtain a specific result of A greater than B or B greater than A um, based on our method of selecting the data. So the way we select the data is uncorrelated with or orthogonal to the, the kind of statistical test that we are going to run. So this seems pretty safe. Now here, now we have these two conditions, correct and incorrect, and here is the difference plot. So here we see the time frequency power for error minus correct, so it's just this map minus this map. Now if we go in and select this window here and test the data in this window for error minus correct at p less than 0.05, that is a biased sample. So we are selecting, specifically we are selecting the data that maximizes the, um, the statistical contrast uh, or the condition contrast, and then we would be statistically testing whether that effect is uh, is significant. You can imagine doing this with random data. If this were a, just a map of random data, and you looked all through the data and you picked where the random noise happened to be biggest, and then you, you put those largest values into a um, statistical test, you are very likely to find that, that that's going to be statistically significant, even though it's just random data. So that's kind of the key thought experiment. If you would replace these with random numbers, would you still get a significant uh, result? So if you wanted to 
um, test for differences in power for error minus correct, there are two ways you could do it. One would be to do your statistics on this difference map, but then you would have to apply some kind of um, multiple comparisons correction for the fact that you're testing all of these different um, pixels. Or um, you would average these two together. So don't look at this, you average these two together. And then you would pick, and it, it you know happens to be that here you would pick basically the same window, it would be something like this. But at least you're picking the window in a way that's orthogonal to this actual difference. So this would be um, an inappropriate analysis strategy. Um, but that said, um, I would like to stress that, that if you have a result like this, and then you draw this box in here, and then you plot the data. Now, is this appropriate or inappropriate? This is where things start to get a little bit more subtle. So testing for these differences, um, statistically, this is inappropriate because we selected these data according to showing a big effect. So of course they're going to show an effect, so we expect a significant result. So running a t-test between these two is uh, biased, and this would be um, either full-on inappropriate, or you can do the test, but just make sure that you're very clear when you interpret this finding that this sort of has to be significant or is extremely likely to be significant because it's done in a, in a biased way. But that said, plotting the data in a different way like this, based on this plot, this can be very insightful and this can be a very useful approach. So here I say not double dipping. So actually putting this significance star here, this would be inappropriate, but plotting the data like this in this different way um, is not inappropriate. And here's why. Here we just have a difference map. So condition A minus condition B. And here from this difference map, the, the results for the two conditions could look either like this or like this. And what you only, what you see in this map is only this distance between this bar and this bar, which is the same as the distance between this bar and this bar. However, when you see these two plots, you would interpret the results in very different ways. So here you would say there's an increase in theta in both conditions, but a bigger increase in condition A. And here you would say there's no change in theta relative to baseline or whatever for condition A. And for condition B, there's a suppression of theta. So the interpretation of this result is very different. Um, so this is definitely not inappropriate. This is definitely an appropriate way to explore your data. But putting this, um, so test, doing a t-test on these two um, groups of, of data values, this either would be full on inappropriate or should be interpreted very cautiously. And you should let people know that, that this is a significance that this significance shouldn't be overly interpreted because it was these data were selected in a biased way. I hope that makes sense. Okay, here we have another condition uh, situation where we are looking at the difference between A and B and now selecting this window, but we are going to apply this window to two different um, conditions C and D, which are not um, uh, this, so these conditions don't fall into this map. So in this case, this is also um, most likely to be appropriate, assuming that conditions C and D are unrelated to conditions A and B, right? So if, let's say A is errors and B is correct. If A and B are error and correct, you know, when you test someone before lunch and C and D is when you test someone after lunch, then uh, I would say that's inappropriate. Um, but yeah, of course, so if these conditions have nothing to do with conditions A and B, then this would be okay. This is a more difficult situation because now we have condition A in both, you know, in the way you selected the data and in the test, but then the test is against condition C. So this, you know, this is a, can be a, can be appropriate or it can be inappropriate depending on what the relationship is between condition A and, uh, sorry, condition C and condition B. So in general, you know, I would say probably do you want to avoid a situation like this when possible? So you just don't have to be concerned about it. So, um, so that said, so here's my recommendation for how to choose time frequency windows 
um, in, uh, in an appropriate way. So the first thing to do would be to, um, to average the data over all the conditions and over all the subjects. And then you pick your time frequency window and now you go into um, this window. So in this case, it's just a frequency window here and I'm plotting the data over time. And then you plot for the three different conditions. So notice you don't see these three conditions in this plot because this is averaged over all of them. So this plot just tells us there is something task related that's happening here, but we don't know how it breaks down by the different conditions. And this tells us how it breaks down by the different conditions according to, um, uh, yeah, within this window that we know is task relevant. And here, these statistical tests were done at 0.05, correcting for multiple comparisons over time, but we don't have to correct for multiple comparisons over frequencies because we don't have, we've already selected out a particular frequency range. So, I think you get the idea. The important thing is to choose your analysis window in such a way that um, that it's unrelated to the comparison, the statistical comparison that you'd like to make. Or if you do um, select uh, the data in a biased way, then you have to make sure that you are appropriately correcting for multiple comparisons. Um, I, I think this, I won't say anything else about this. I think uh, this, this is a very important point. Um, because you don't want to be doing uh, inappropriate statistics. But I, I think it's not so, if you're aware of this issue and you think carefully about the analyses, I think it's not very difficult to um, avoid uh, uh, biasing your selection. There's one more point I'd like to make about statistics, um, which is I'm trying to infer or guess statistical significance based on error bars. So here we have two conditions. Um, let's say, you know, condition A and condition B. And now the question is, are these two conditions statistically significantly different from each other? So whenever I ask this question in, uh, in, in courses or lectures, there's always, you know, some people say yes and some people say no and some people aren't sure so they're too afraid to ask. But now, so, uh, but many people seem to think no. and. People often say, no, there's no differences because you look at the error bars and the error bars are hugely overlapping between these two. So I'm going to guess, no, that these two things are, these two means are not statistically significantly different from each other. But now what if I show you this and I say each line is an individual subject. So here's subject one in condition A and subject one in condition B. Now you see every individual uh, subject goes up from, you know, uh, on condition B compared to condition A. So in fact, this would be a wildly significant uh, uh, effect because every single subject shows the same pattern. So this, so these two means actually are very, uh, very um, significantly different from each other, even though the error bars overlap. So, um, and then, you know, there's always someone in the class who says, well, but I read once it's blah, blah, blah. So, it is true that there are situations where you can infer statistical significance based on the error bars. It depends on um, what the what is being shown in the data. So in this case, these are standard errors of the mean, which just tell us about the variability over subjects. Um, so it depends on whether these error bars are standard errors of the mean or whether they are confidence intervals. It depends on whether this is a within subjects or a group or a um, uh, or cross subjects uh, analysis, um, and uh, and it probably depends on other things that I'm I'm not thinking of now. So, well, here is just a different situation where the error bar is smaller, um, indicating that the subject level variance is smaller, and maybe here there's no significant uh, group effect. So, it is sometimes possible to determine statistical significance based on error bars. Again, it depends on what the error bars represent. It depends on features of the data that you have to, you would have to be informed about what exactly is happening in the plot, what exactly is being shown. But it's often not possible to, to infer statistical significance purely from looking at error bars. That's not to say that error bars are meaningless. They are meaningful. Here you would say that there's certainly greater variability across subjects in this condition than in this condition. I don't know, maybe that's meaningful for whatever reason. But in general, I recommend avoiding uh, guessing 
statistical significance just from visual inspection of error bars whenever possible because I think the the danger of getting it wrong is uh, is fairly high. Okay, well, I hope you found this informative. Again, I think doing statistics appropriately and avoiding these pitfalls is not so difficult. It's just you have to kind of keep these issues in mind and then you think about it and then it'll be um, everything will be fine.